Welcome to the Half Blood Report. Here we dive deep into recent Demigod news, upcoming presents books, questions only Zeus knows the answer to, and all over things, Riordan. I'm Samuel, your co host. And I'm Diego, your other co host. So let's jump into the Demigod news. Uh, yeah, so, um, we got a couple of articles this week. The most important one, um, you know, skipping to the big stuff right off, uh, being the Rick Riordan presents, uh, Win Big. Yeah, so this was, uh, really great. Both Carlos Hernandez, uh, author of Soil and Gabby, Break the Universe, and Kwame Mubalia, author of Tristan Strong Punches a Holden Skull, they won big awards for each of their book, um, individually Sal and Gabby winning the Puda Belpre author award hope I said that right and Puda Belpre was the first Latino writer uh, to uh, run I think the New York Pub- Public Library and uh, so that's sort of an honor for him and Carlos Hernandez won an award uh, for Sal and Gabby uh, for just you know uh, outstanding latino uh yeah uh book. tristan strong punches a hole in the sky by uh kwame Mbalia, who we did interview on the podcast uh in october i believe it was episode four um won a coretta scott king award um and you know those are kind of like recognizing um african-american like authors and illustrators for uh their achievements and uh amazing books yeah, and that's obviously an award f- founded by the uh, wife of Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, so I just, uh, if Carlos Hernandez and Kwame Mbalia uh, listen to a podcast, I assume they don't, but just a huge congratulations to both of them. Um, if you're listening to this and you have time, just like, you know, tweet at them and congratulations. It's a little bit late, but like, uh, these were some pretty big things, and I think it's really good yeah. for Rick Ryan Presents. This is happening and we got like our first Rick Riordan Presents book in 2018, and it's already like making these big steps. And uh, it's just sort of, I think, great because those were two very good and very deserving books this year. Yeah, yeah, uh, I definitely agree with you. Um, we did in depth reviews of both of them, and they're amongst uh, some of the best books that I've read. Uh, we got um, another kind of not really a promotional article, but kind of like a weird uh, recap slash summary and spoiler thing. <laughs> um, uh, they just kind of um, outlined like the trials that Nizoni, Nizoni um, faces during uh, during Race to the Sun, which uh, if you guys haven't ordered already, uh, make sure to do it off the link in the website. Um, it's a fantastic book and... Uh, yeah, be sure to look out for a more in-depth review um, in a future episode. Yeah, um, I think probably since we're finishing up Demigodathon this week, we're probably going to be talking about Race of the Sun uh, next week. So, yes, definitely keep uh, a lookout for our review on Race of the Sun. But this was another one of our January slew of Race of the Sun promotional articles, basically just saying... If you haven't read the book yet, <laughs> here are some interesting <laughs> yeah. things that you will want to read about. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, other news uh, in the uh, fandom. <clears throat> well, to be fair, this isn't really news. We had a slow news week for Demigod News. And we like to usually, uh, we didn't manage this uh, last week, I think. But we like to usually just at least talk about three things worth mentioning in the demigod news and so i realized that there wasn't a lot talk to talk about and we also didn't talk about a lot last week so then i kind of did some research and i realized that there was one thing kind of important which we hadn't talked about and that's kind of our bad for not talking about it earlier um so this is an article um from the publishers weekly and they basically did an interview with Te- uh, Tehler K. Mejia, who, if you don't know, is writing the Rick Riordan Presents book. Uh, Palo Santiago and the River of Tears, which I believe comes out in uh, August? Yes, August, and we talked about it in episode 6. And we will be talking more about it in the future. So this was an interview, and I thought it was pretty interesting what was discussed. So I think the main takeaway from this article, there's obviously a link in the description if you want to read it yourself, is that Paula Santiago will be taking more of a horror or spooky story approach than not just most middle grade novels, 
but the Rick Riordan Presents imprint as a whole. Yeah, um, so this will definitely be one of the um, scarier novels that that we will see in the uh, Rick Riordan Presents uh, imprint. Actually, if you take a look at uh, the cover, there's like, um, you see uh, Paula Santiago kind of like, uh, well, I assume it's Paula Santiago, kind of on one side and then this kind of hand reaching out of the river and then kind of behind her, you see her shadow, but instead of being like her, it's this creepy monster. Um, yeah, and you have to take into account the original uh, title for Paulo Santiago was Paulo Santiago and the Drowned Place, which is like either title you pick. They're both spooky uh, and like kind of scary, and the cover is, like Diego mentioned, is spooky. And I think this is kind of interesting because... A lot of the Rick Riordan Presents book, while all being good, have followed similar formulas to the Percy Jackson book. I think it's pretty yeah. fair to say. Yeah. Maybe the big, uh, the the big exceptions or standouts the being Sal and Gabby and and Dragon Pearl. Um, yeah, yeah, which took more a sci-fi approach um, as opposed to mythology. Yes. Yeah, so those, I think, uh, but mostly, uh, and no offense to Storm Runner, Arusha, and Tristan Strong, uh, I, or Race to the Sun. Yes, or Race to the Sun. I love all those books. Um, but I think they are, and nothing bad about it, I think they are following the Percy Jackson formula, uh, not like down to the last like period or comma, but you know. Something relatively similar. Yes, relatively similar. So I'm interested to see how closely Paolo Santiago will follow Santiago. this. Santiago. I am, I am Paola I'm Santiago. I'm disappointed in you from, from one Latino to another. Yes. Uh Paola Santiago. Don't worry, I'll make sure to hit Samuel with a chancla once this episode is over. He will try. <laughs> uh no, yeah, so I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how Paola Santiago will play out differently than other Rick Ryan presents books and especially when it comes to the Percy Jackson style formula. And maybe carving a path for future Rick Ryan presents books. So maybe the Percy Jackson, I mean, the Rick Riordan Presents books we get in, like, say, 2021 or 2022 might get to straight yeah, even further. further from the formula. Um, well, at least include some sort of, well, not even mythology, because uh, uh, Carlos Hernandez kind of went off that. Um, I think we might see the Rick Riordan imprint kind of developing more into, like, um, just good books um, with with, like interesting cultural um content i guess i don't know i don't know yeah and i don't know how to phrase it but like what i'm trying to say is that it might it might be less about like things that are related to percy jackson or you know mythology related and it might become more of like a culture thing and um just good books in general and i think there are plenty of books out there that only have that are much more realistic fiction and only have the slightest hints of sci-fi. Yeah. I can't name any examples off the top of my head. Um, but yes, yeah. there are plenty of books that are like not too, like they don't like say, oh, I fought monsters or like I have these special powers. But they're like, and one day something weird happened. And they go around like, and they go back to telling like this middle school story about a kid struggling to make friends. And then they like don't really fully explain the mystical aspect of the book. Exactly. And I think there are a lot of books like that. And I think it's not too far off to say that in the future, yes, we probably will get Rick Ryan Presents books talking about culture, mythology. But I think we probably will be getting more culture books with the slightest uh, fantasy or sci-fi aspects and, to them. Um, yes, in the future. And I personally trust uh, Uncle Rick's judgment. Um, and you'll probably just pick good authors who have written good things and will, you know, write even better yeah. books. And at the end of the day, the goal of Rick Riordan Presents is, yes, partly to learn about other mythologies. Uh, basically, to have authors uh, write stuff that Rick Riordan isn't comfortable writing himself. Uh but it's also, there's this huge part of Rick Riordan Presents, which I think will end up at the in a couple of years, or maybe even now, being the most important part of Rick Riordan Presents. Um, and that is representing authors from other cultures. And I think that's something really important because the publishing industry is very white-centric. And so I think just uh, like getting these authors out there and having Rick Riordan behind them is the best thing. So I like the book doesn't have to be mythology centric. It just, I think 
I think we're getting to a point, not now, but like maybe in in the near future or something, where where the Rick Riordan presents imprint will be less of a, a mythology, mythology thing and more just uh, Rick Riordan highlighting good authors from different cultural backgrounds. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely. Um, so you want to move on? Yeah, let's move on to the next section. Um, so yeah, uh, Reordan Review, uh, name's pretty self-explanatory, um, and in this section we, uh, review either a recent Reordan book or a reread. Um, Shem? Yes, and so we are continuing this pattern of using the section to follow along with hashtag Demigodathon. Again, if you don't know what Demigodathon is, it is an event going on in the fandom, uh, for people to reread the Percy Jackson and the Olympians week by week. Today and is unfortunately the last week, um, but we did read uh, the last Olympian this week, um, and that's this so, week's reordering review. Yeah, basically. I, I think it's. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> we took a whole minute just to tell you that we were going to do the last Olympian. Uh, I think it's kind of funny that um. Where we're talking about how like oh Demigodathon is ending and it is sad because like like it was fun to do this as a yeah. com- in, uh, internet community like rereading yeah. the books, yeah. Um, except like reordered in 2020 is starting. It's starting like right after, <laughs> so it'll be it'll be interesting. Um, definitely is, we'll we'll follow along with any events in the fandom as we are the prime source of demigod news <laughs> there, there, are, there are other great percy jackson podcasts out there but we do the news yeah yeah we, we do the recent stuff yeah um, no but we'll definitely make sure to follow along with anything else that happens so without further ado um or need for introduction or really just words in general uh, <laughs> a podcast without words that's how we're definitely our- starting one of those we're calling it the it can just be blood. We, no but we can just like be the most artsy podcast and we'll it's just, just like, no words no words at all just it's not even sound i think we should try it for like a whole minute one two three eight four five six seven Oh, I, no! I was joking. Wait, we can't do a ma- <laughs> we can't do math two episodes in a row, Diego. My case in point, uh, my math midterm grade. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so what did you notice? Uh, this this week. Um, well, this time reading the last Olympian that you hadn't noticed before. Uh, yeah. So this was a uh, fun, like a very mentioned- action packed book. Yes, as I mentioned before, I was. Re- listening to the audiobooks this time rereading probably the last olympian was the most painful for audiobooks <laughs> yeah cuz having to switch the voices so much no cuz there there's just a lot more new characters who like who have more lines than usual like Travis and Connor Stoll like the, so the last olympian is there are characters from Camp half that are mentioned in all the books in the first few chapters and in the last few chapters. And they're not mentioned throughout most of the book because Percy's out adventuring and the not important characters aren't there with him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except Annabeth is, unfortunately. Uh, she's important. And a good character. Terrible. But there are... I like Annabeth. Thank you. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, folks, uh, we'd like you to meet our uh, new guest host. We yeah we are we are recording in Diego in S- Sophia's bedroom and so she's she's working quietly and we're very thankful to her not being disturbing. Uh, but yes, it was it was good to shout out Diego like that. He 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 he's very bad when it comes to Annabeth. But I was going to say that I think <laughs> since since the 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 whole style of the Battle of Manhattan it is. It is all these. It's confusing. All, no, it's the. It's all the. Oh, yeah. It's all the characters from Camp Half Blood, who it's basically Camp Half Blood facing it off against a monster army. It's not Percy and his two to four friends exactly. by his side. It's yeah. Camp Half Blood, um, Percy leading them, but it's Camp Half Blood, and so all these characters who were mentioned at Camp Half Blood maybe never got really important roles are there alongside him for most of the book, and that's. The Stoll brothers, that's Selena Beauregard, that's Charles Beckendorf. From. Well, that's well. <laughs> no, that's that's Michael Yu, and that's uh, Jake Mason. Uh, uh, it, uh, 
No, but it's true. Charles Beckendorf plays a bigger role in this book than he plays in any of the other books. That's not to say I that... I think he has like a whole three lines and then gets blown up. That was very insensitive, Diego. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I guess I'm not really Charles Beckendorf. And so since that sort of format, it does involve a lot more... It almost reminds me of yeah. Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> Where everything's happening and it's a terrible book a movie um no but it's there's a lot of parts in rise of skywalker because the jj abrams he likes to just give his friends roles in the movie and just say hey you can say a one-liner in a star wars movie and they're like thanks jj i'm your best friend and then he ruins you know the star wars universe as a whole um moving on (laughs) i'm not done (laughs) no so there are a lot of like those one-liners and it's also like avengers endgame like a lot of characters who there's just so many characters a lot of them have to say let me say a one line of exposition and the guy's like let me see say the next line of exposition yeah um but especially we like, especially have like, uh arrived it's like <laughs> we, we have to blow the bad guys up but how are we gonna do it i don't I know, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, you know just that that one magician like s- s- and then that, like, one random Wakanda warrior. And then, I don't know. I can't think of anything else. Yeah, but, so, The Last Olympian feels like that. Like, there are a lot of characters that I mentioned and been bef- mentioned before because they're just one offers. And so we were to have them in the back of the head. But this book, when Rick Riordan is like, oh, yeah, all those people who are kind of in the back of your head, now they're, like, in the front lines. Um, of your head. <laughs> I just had an image of all the characters from Camp half like, just cutting their swords into your brain. Like, yeah, die, brain. Um, I think we should take a moment of silence to remember the ones who died. Okay, moving on. No, but, yeah, so <laughs> I think, and so that was what, so that's, like, a very interesting aspect of the book and how the formula of The Last Olympian, it's much more different than the formula of the other Percy Jackson book. It's not a quest. It's this big battle. Um, yeah. And it does... So that's that's a very interesting, uh, not necessarily good or bad part of the book. But it was very bad for the audio format because the author really tries, in my opinion, too hard... Author? Or uh, the voice guy? Yeah, the, the narrator tries too hard to give each character independent voice. So... It ends up with like Michael Yu and this like weird Texan accent and like the Stoll brothers like super high pitched. Yeah. And like it was just too too much for me to handle. And then Clarice is like, "Hey." <laughs> <laughs> uh, like honestly, <laughs> it's not that good. But please just listen to the Last Olympian audiobook so you can feel my pain. But to be completely honest, uh, I would love a audiobook narration with Rick Riordan narrating the Percy Jackson books. Yeah, that would be amazing. Because, like he said, he said that he can't listen to audiobooks of his books because it's just not right to him. And so, and I've listened to the audiobooks of his books, and it's not right to me <laughs> either. So I think we but, agree with Uncle Rick. Yeah, I think that he honestly like should take it into his own hands and he kind of has like uh when he does promotional articles for charles apollo he reads a chapter of the book uh and so he reads a chapter of the book and they upload and it and it's for the best for narrator that you could ever get because it's the person who wrote it yeah and it's not like this has never happened before there are plenty of audio books that have been narrated by the author like i think lord of the flies like a classic book has been narrated by the author um and so the i I know Rick Riordan. The author would be the person who would best know the voices of their characters. Yeah, and now that Rick Riordan is wrapping up the the Tower of Nero in his final book, I think that would be a great time for him to relax and just, you know, read his books for for money. He wrote his books for money, and he didn't (laughs) read them for money. (laughs) Imagine just chilling wherever it is that Rick lives, just reading your books and making mad racks. I would loan Rick Riordan the equipment and edit the audio to get 
those those audiobooks. Yeah. So Clarice wouldn't sound like a demented child. No, she's like Well she is, but like she says, Die, Draken <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, No, die me, please. <laughs> Take me first. <laughs> um Screw yeah. the Draken. <laughs> no, so that's Stab kind of me. That's kind of one of the initial things I noticed. The formula is different. A lot more characters getting one-liners. Not that that's a bad thing. Uh, yeah. Not great for the audiobook, but um, it was it was very interesting for the last time I've been. Your thoughts, yeah, Diego? Yeah. Um, so the kind of stuff that I noticed is I just noticed, yeah, um, as you said, way more background characters than the first time around. And also the typhoon moment, um, like, you know, when they pull typhoon. in. Typhoon. Typhoon, Typhoon, that guy. Um, when they pull him down, like, into the Hudson River. Like, it felt much more dramatic. Like, I remembered it much more dramatic than it actually was. Like, I feel like the Cyclops, like, only popped out of the water and then, like, hooked him and then, like, pulled him down. As opposed to, like, I imagined it that they, like, threw spears and stabbed him and, like, crawled all over him and then finally, like, pushed him beneath the waves. Um, but it wasn't actually like that. And I was... Yeah, I kind of disappointed. I think that's kind of the point. Like that, Typhon was like Kronos's, like basically not exactly his trick up his slave because he was holding it the first time, but it was kind of like his um, I don't know, like the like his Ace big, in the hat. It was like his big player. It's like losing like your queen in chess, mm. and so I think that sort of like quick annihilation. Of like Typhon is really like when Cronus is like no, um, yeah. and he's like he's kind of mad because like that was like his big player like he didn't exactly expect it to be the one to capture the king aka destroy Olympus he expected him to be the one to do that but it was too important for him to lose it was what he needed to kill all the other pieces aka yeah. distract yeah. the gods that's like playing a malignous like right after somebody slashes, like, the top person's HP in, like, half. What? A magic reference, my bad. Oh. Ew. <laughs> no, Imagine uh, playing magic. Okay, no, to actually, to people who like uh, collectible card games, nothing against the game Magic. Uh, no, I, it's a great game. I like c certain collectible card games, and they're just certain that don't fit my play style and aren't exactly what I like. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a fan of the game. Don't get offended, but uh, I can't believe you play Magic there. was such a disgusting, disgusting man. He says while running a Rick Riordan podcast. It's okay, man. Well, <laughs> we love what we do. Yes, uh, we're having we're having a good time. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, anything else. I mean, I'm, there's a there's there's a lot of stuff. Else. There's a a lot um, of stuff to digest here, and I I just finished the book today, so I'm still kind of like processing what exactly I, I i finished it like a while ago but that's because i had um a bunch of free days sorry about that um oh wait you're gonna cut that so they'll never know that i burped that's going that's going in at the end <laughs> just just a burp <laughs> um at least you said excuse me oh yeah, I'm a very like, polite person. If you just tried to conceal it, exactly, kept exactly. Then, then it just wouldn't have been good. It would have been very bad. Um, no, I'm like the most polite person anyone could like ever meet. Mm, yeah, uh, I mean, off, 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 like when we're not no. recording, Diego is the nicest person. Yeah, yeah, I'm just <laughs> such a great person. You wouldn't even understand. No, <laughs> there's not a trace of sarcasm in our voice. <laughs> um, no, but I, I think, um. Uh, one one more thing that I um, wanted to mention, um, you know, uh, when Percy kind of goes down into the underworld to like bathe in the river Styx, um, I always wondered, did he take off his clothes, or does he just go in with his clothes? No, he went in with his clothes because it doesn't. That's, that's I like see like why would I go into like a river with my clothes? Oh, I mean, Nico was there. That makes sense. Um, well, as we find out in in the blood of Olympus, I, I don't think you. Want, I don't finish that sentence, Diego. Don't finish that sentence. Um, no, 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 no. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I find it weird. Um, that he went in with his clothes. 
Okay. That seems odd. This is a very wise podcast. <laughs> Big takeaway from Last Olympia. <laughs> Why didn't Percy take his clothes off his clothes before taking a bath? Um, yeah, that's yeah. Come on, Percy. I mean, like he's faced immortal uh, dragons and Medusa, and you know the the three furies, but he doesn't know how to take a shower. I mean. Has he ever showered, like, on screen in any of the books? Well, to be fair, I don't think he can because he doesn't, he doesn't get wet unless he wants to. And I don't think teenage boys want to get wet. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So that means when he takes a shower, he doesn't feel anything? Maybe he just, like, gets his hair wet and then, like, his mom is like, oh, you showered. He's like, mm-hmm. And then just like wait, wait, wait! Can he make his hair wet? I think he can just like like I think. I can think, he just like make the water like appear in his hair? Is that no, a thing? it's just like certain. He can choose which part of his body to stay dry. Dude, that's so weird. No, wait, but how? Why didn't he know that earlier? Like, how did he just find out he was a demigod if he never gets like, if he always is dry in the shower? Well, no, it's like the classic Harry Potter thing where you like, you don't. You can't like use your po- like powers for the little things like Lumos or like just getting light in the room or like just bringing something to your hand until like you in the beginning you're just using your stuff in extreme circumstances yeah. like you know breaking the snake out or in Percy's case like dousing Nancy Boba Fett when he's super angry right so in the beginning it's not like <sighs> you're using your powers when you're really stressed or you're really emotional but as you lo- learn to use your powers more you can use it for just daily conveniences like Percy like I don't want to shower today well no he doesn't even have to shower he can just control the soapy water to go around his body and like clean him That's- so he just he just gets like a bucket of water puts some soap in it and then just makes it go wherever he wants to Oh, go. just like steps in it and then it just goes up his body. And yeah, goes and back then into just the covers bucket. everything. Yeah. Dude, that's sick. I like how, how does he brush his teeth. How does that work? I like how other podcasts, <laughs> I like how other podcasts talk about how, how like they talk literary discussions about Percy Jackson and like the no, themes I'm, I'm and morals. And I'm we wondering talk about- how my man is brushing his teeth. Oh. How does that work? Does he even need a toothbrush? Just Does he just put toothpaste and then make the toothpaste go all around his mouth? Does he have control of water inside of him? Look, we already know he has. Com- he's the supreme lord of the bathroom. He's a master at brushing his teeth, okay? Oh. Hmm. He does the toiletry, he does the plumbing, he does the shower. He- oh, yeah, he's never going to have to get a plumber. He can just <laughs> make the water do whatever it is that he wants to do. I he would, was living the life. I would be very upset if Diego was the demigod who's who was our only chance to save the world. <laughs> um, he would no, use I, his power for like crazy stuff, and then when Kronos comes around, he's like, "I never practiced my sword fighting, but I can brush my teeth." Yeah, that, that'd be the most useful thing. I wonder if he can. Can he like make dolphins do his homework? I, I think dolphins are probably smarter. And, and Percy. The, not. Ma- <laughs> I was going to say them the average human, but, you know, you took the words. Okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that'd be interesting. Wait, because the paper would never get wet. Okay, you know what else is interesting? <laughs> uh, the last Olympian. <laughs> I think we've gone off track a little bit. Um, you think? <laughs> just a tiny bit. Um, yeah, so back to the last Olympian. I. Um, there's a lot of good moments in it, but I have to say, like, I'm a huge fan of the action scenes. Uh, I yeah, but the Minotaur scene on the bridge. But honestly, I have to say, the whole Rachel plotline is very boring on a reread. Um, I'm not sure if I agree because you know Rachel's the one that should end up winning because Annabeth is a terrible character. No, I'm um, saying the Oracle plotline. Oh, oh, yeah, that seemed really strange. I don't know. She doesn't like. M- she doesn't appear much. She appears in like a couple of dreams, and then at the end, she just becomes the oracle. Um, and then she flies in on a helicopter or something, and it's just really weird. Yeah, to me, it it felt actually the opposite. I felt like a lot of time was devoted to setting Rachel up as the oracle, and it's and it's also like very tries to be jumpy about it and stay away. And I think that stuff is very 
interesting. Like, I remember reading the book for the first time and being very interested in the Rachel plotline. But when you're rereading, you're coming back for those great action scenes. Like, you're coming back for those great scenes against Kronos and Luke sacrificing himself. You're coming back to revisit Grover and Talia and Tyson for one last time. You're coming back for those sweet Last Olympian Mm -hmm. Persebeth moments. The Last Olympian has the best Persebeth moments. And so... There's yeah. a lot of yeah, and there's there's that great like reward in the throne room scene, like that scene, like hail, uh, I think like Perseus Jackson, Perseus. hero of Olympus, and my big brother. <laughs> yeah, um, that's like such a it's like all such a sweet scene, and it like there are so many nostalgic moments that people come back yeah. to the last Olympian specifically and, out and of the Percy Jackson book. Like the Rachel stuff just kind of took away from it. Not even not took away from it. It just it it always feels like a part I want to skip on a reread, and it I don't think anyone, I mean, if if this is you and I'm like wrong, then just email our podcast. But I don't think any, yeah, let us know. Uh, we'll ha- do an episode on Rachel because she was the better alternative to Annabeth. Okay. But I don't think there's a, I don't think there's like really uh like anybody who comes back to reread the Last Olympian. Because they really want to reread Rachel becoming like the Oracle or like finding out that she has these powers or Percy like finding out about May Castella. I don't think anyone comes back yeah, for that particular yeah. plot line. And so it's an interesting plot line. It's a necessary plot line for the book. Yeah. It and just, for the rest of the books as well. It's just like rewatching a movie and you like want to skip the exposition scenes. You yeah, know? exactly. It's not very entertaining on that sort of reread. No, I know I know exactly what you mean. Um, I didn't feel as such. Well, kind of, but I still thought the May, the May, uh, Castellan, Castellan, I'm not Cas- sure. Castellan, Castellan. Um, that scene. Um, that's just kind of like. Um, I I really like that scene. Um, because it's one of the scenes in which you kind of just feel sad, for everything that like has happened to all of them. Um. And you feel sad for Luke, and it's the, like I feel like the moment where you most understand like his family and like what he's gone through, mm. um, and like why this all happened. And I I also just like it's a really sad moment in um in the books. Like I don't maybe other people don't feel as such, um, but I feel as like it's just depressing to like always think that your son's coming back, but he's never actually gonna make it home. And you're just baking, like, cookies and making him Kool-Aid for the day he comes back. But you always forget that the day he comes back, like, was three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. Um, And, you know, Rick never touches upon that. Well, I don't know. I haven't read uh, Burning Maze um, or the, uh, what's it called? Tyrant's Tomb. Tyrant's Tomb. Um, But uh, as far as I'm concerned, like, he doesn't touch upon like may ever again and kind of just the last we see the first and last we see of her is just her in an endless cycle uh always waiting for a son that'll never make it yeah i think that is a very sad very traumatic and very powerful chapter uh when we meet may castella and and when she's kind of mentioned uh again throughout the book but to be to to kind of add on it was boring for me but the last time I reread The Last Olympian. It was actually quite recently. It was late December when I was reading it to my Jesus. sister. And so um, when I was reading it to her for the first time. And so I read it, re- have reread it really recently. And there, and so that powerful, like that sort of make a Stellan stuff, just again, like I just sort of experienced all those emotions and just like digested them. So going back to it wasn't really adding much to my experience and it was another one of that sort of it just kind of felt to me like more sort of setting up the rachel storyline yeah yeah um and so i think if i'd like waited a few months between the rereads and not just Mm -hmm. like a month it wouldn't have been like as you Mm -hmm. know sort of not as exciting for me and yeah the other rachel bits are just completely expository and useless i feel um i think rachel much better has much better moments in in the, um the battle the, of the labyrinth oh yeah and in the battle of the labyrinth when she throws um the brush and she also has some pretty good moments um and i feel like it's the not the mark of the you know, the lost the hero the, yeah she has some in the lost hero she also has some um towards the end at the battle of camp half blood 
Yeah. Um. Yeah. She has some. She has some nice moments in Heroes of Olympus, and you get to see like an actual positive Annabeth Rachel relationship. And uh, and I'd have to say, my favorite Rachel moment is in the Battle of the Labyrinth when she when she hits Cronus with a brush. But my second favorite Rachel moment is in the Titan's Curse when she first meets Percy. And it's like that, I think, is a very good Rachel, her using her abilities to trick those guards and save Percy yeah. for the first time. And so I think in the last... Also of, a great moment um, in the band closet. Yeah, yeah, but that's Battle of the Labyrinth. Oh, that's... But also, also a good moment. But yeah, so I'm just kind of saying that I don't think any of Rachel's best moments are in The Last Olympian. But, you know, um, email a podcast if you disagree. Yeah, uh, hit us up. Uh, with that, um, I think we'll uh, wrap up the episode here. Um, we had some uh, laughs, maths, and and some off-track stuff about uh, Percy. Um, I, you, <laughs> you had some off-track stuff about Percy. No, I'm, I'm like, honestly, does Annabeth, like, ace every test? Like, how does it work? How are you, like, a genius, but... So, I... Uh, like, she's really smart, how can you contact this podcast? Uh, you can tweet it with compliments, <laughs> questions, corrections, or suggestions at at Half Report on Twitter. You can also find us on Instagram at the Half Little Report. What about like the Hypnos Cabin? Are they like making their like friends in class like go to sleep? Is that a thing or no? They just sleep. They just sleep. They just sleep. Yeah, they're just like the kids sleeping in the back of the room. And you can email us. What about if you were a polo? Would you be on the basketball team? I feel at, like you'd be on the basketball team. At the report at gmail.com. Definitely on the basketball team. And you can also get us on our website, thehalfbloodreport.com. <gasps> what about Demeter? Do you just like sit around and like watch plants grow? Do, do you eat salad or do you not eat the salad? That said, <laughs> it's time for our credits. Our theme music is actually by Diego. Yeah, but thanks. Oh, wait. If I weren't a polo kid, I bet I could compose some... Are all Apollo kids, like, musicians? I feel like Apollo's the one who has, like, the most useful talents. Okay. Diego's talking nonsense, so I'm actually going to do the credits <laughs> without Tim. <laughs> so. Uh, um, that said, <laughs> it's time for the credits. Uh, our theme music is actually by me. I do most of our editing, and our recording equipment is on loan from William Bachman. My co-host here is Samuel, and I'm Diego. This is the Half Lit Report podcast, the only HBR that matters. Survive till next week. This is Samuel in the studio, and I just wanted to say, burps are kind of hard to edit. <laughs>